All right, so I'll go ahead and start. My name is Rich Procida. I'm the founder of the Truth and Democracy Coalition. I write opinion articles at laprogressive.com. I have a blog at Modern Lectionaries, um, buzzflash.com. I also produce two podcasts, Democracy Under Fire, and this will be a recording of those two podcasts. Podcast. Um, I also do another podcast, which is basically the same podcast, just what I'm doing. It's Bible study for progressives. And we have this event, but we have three events coming up I want to tell you about. I'll post them in the chat. Religion and the Freedom to Choose is coming up on July. What is that? On well, all right. I can. I think, yeah, I think it's July, what, 12th, is it? Or 10th? 10. 10. Hi, Mom. This is my mother, Dixie. Um, climate change and democracy, hope or hindrance is um, going to be on August, what is that, 14th. And then on June 23rd, we're having a combination event, Zoom and live event for the second primetime January 6th Select Committee hearing watch party. And so I'm gonna put those in the chat. And then, but first I wanna introduce our speaker, Dr. Karen Tamirius, is that right? I believe it is. It, she's the leader of Smart Politics, a group of Democrats, liberals, and other left-leaning types who are trying to save the world by changing how we communicate with people who disagree with us, including Republicans, far-right extremists, and mega supporters. Smart Politics is a progressive advocacy group committed to promoting social, economic, and environmental justice. Dr. Tamirius teaches skills for talking with Republicans and other right-leaning folks in their natural habitat. <laughs> she wrote, we consider ourselves bridgers in the sense that we were fully committed to the cause of political depolarization and support all efforts to bring folks on the left and right together for dialogue, because that's in the best interest of the progressive, of the progressive movement and the nation. Dr. Tamirius is an experienced political activist social scientist and physician with a unique understanding of the intersection between politics and human psychology. Trained in psychology at UC San Francisco, as well as political and social psychology at the University of Michigan, she synthesizes complex ideas about public opinion, formulates new theories of attitude change, and implements more effective campaign communication practices. And with that, I'd like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Tamarius and, um, and I'll put the links in the chat. Thank you so much, Rich. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, well, hi, everybody. Um, I'm, I am really impressed by the turnout tonight. This is, uh, or this afternoon, it's fabulous. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be doing is giving you kind of our standard smart politics introduction to smart politics presentation. And helping me is, is going to be Locke Peter Syme, who will be monitoring the chat. Welcome everybody to Introduction to Smart Politics. Stop arguing, stop avoiding, and start making a difference. Um, as Rich said, I'm Dr. Karen Tamarius, and I'm the founder of Smart Politics. And I'm a political psychiatrist, which is a kind of a rare thing. A psychiatrist, um, meaning I'm a medical doctor trained in clinical psychiatry and psychotherapy, but I'm also a uh, trained as a political scientist and a political psychologist. And I combine both of these skills um, to do the work I do and uh, to teach folks how to have better communication around politics. 
So here's a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. First, I'm just going to address the question of why do we need to do this at all? Uh, it's a question I get asked a lot and um, we'll, we'll go through that a little bit. Second, the five big mistakes people make when they do try to communicate with people they strongly disagree with. And then I'll offer a better way. And this is really the smart politics approach to political communication. Um, we'll do a demo. And for the demo, I'll warn you now, I would really like somebody from the audience to kind of step up and, and jump in. And, uh, and for that, I'd like you to channel somebody, like play the part of someone you find really difficult to talk with. In, in your personal life. Like maybe it's uh, your uncle or a parent or even a, a, a child and, um, and, and demonstrate them. And then I'll show you how I would talk to them if, if uh, I, I knew them. And then finally, I'll just open it up to a general Q and A. So, First question is, why are you here? What, what is bringing you here tonight? And uh, I, I often get a lot of different answers to this question. So now that you're inside the, the Mentimeter uh, interface, you should be able to enter your answer to this question. And if you have more than one answer to this question, go ahead and, and give multiple answers. And we've got, I'm definitely avoiding right now, not sure how to get past that. Yeah, very common. Um, want to help drive effective change and help depolarize the country. I love to debate and argue, but uh, I need to be quiet and listen. <laughs> I think a lot of us have that. Uh, the topic sounded interesting, yay. Uh, I want to help people understand why they're misguided. Yeah, the political gap scares me. Can we come together as a nation? Yeah. Um, it's hard not to get angry with, with my mother. Yeah. Um, we pro slavers are already pregnant people, so particularly concerned about reproductive rights. Um, I work on democracy reform and I need a better way to talk to people about how we can make democracy better. Yeah, these skills are absolutely essential for um, not just defending democracy, but actually practicing democracy. Um, looking for wisdom on communicating, want to make change, not enemies. Um, because I realized just recently that the Republicans in my community are very vocal and uh, I'm ready to say something about my perspective. Yeah, yeah. To improve results, I'm afraid that logic and reason are things of the past. Yeah. Um, then the dynamics of election cycles turn a world of gray into stark choices that can polarize. Yeah. Um, Black and white thinking is a real problem in our politics and finding ways to introduce nuance uh, and, and subtlety into political conversations can be really powerful. All right, well, it sounds like you guys have a lot of great reasons for being here and hopefully I, I can address most if not all of these to some extent. So, I'm going to create a word cloud here. And what I'd like from you are three words that describe your current conversations. I know some of you said you just avoid conversations, but let's take the case of when you don't avoid conversations or maybe when you didn't avoid conversations. What would happen? What happens when you encounter a, a Trump voter and, and you start talking? So bitter, trolling, abusive. Uh, 
non-factual, there's name calling, there's no improvement, anger, anger's coming up a lot. A lot of conspiracies, yep, frustrating. The, the conversations are very short. <laughs> a lot of hostility, anger, frustration. argumentative, closed-minded, misinformation, defensive. Okay, so, so I'm getting the sense that, that these things are, are falling into kind of a few different categories. One has to do with kind of the emotions that, that come up. Um, another has to do with the behavior of the other person in the conversation. Um, and, and one really has to do with the content of, of the conversation. So it's kind of conspiracy or disregard for facts, um, propaganda, uh, and, and that. So yeah, so I would, I would say based on this word cloud that things aren't going very well out there right now. And uh, just to bring that home, let's try one more thing. Um, read the following statements about your interactions with people you strongly disagree with politically right now. So take each of these statements and say whether you strongly disagree or strongly agree. And you can put yourself on that slider depending on where you, you fall. A lot of avoidance. Sounds, looks like very few people at this point are having productive conversations. It's not nobody. So what I'm taking from this is that there's a lot of avoidance. And when, when you, uh, and, and you're not just avoiding the topic, the political topics, you're also avoiding the people. So there, there like is reduced opportunity for even having these conversations. And then when you're not avoiding, folks uh, are getting into arguments. And, and so, and then, as you indicate, they aren't particularly productive conversations. The good news, uh, or the bad, depending on how you look at it, you're you're not alone. You don't have to feel bad about this. It uh, th this is a very common finding. Um, the, the good news is it doesn't have to be that way. So. Let's talk now about the five big mistakes that, that I find people make in their conversations. And the number one mistake is thinking people who disagree with you are just fundamentally bad. That, that anyone who could hold that belief must be evil or ignorant or uneducated or stupid. Um, that they couldn't have possibly come by that belief honestly. And, and the reality is that the, nobody is born with the political beliefs they have, but we tend to develop our political beliefs very early in life, or at least our political orientation. And the biggest driver of people's political attitudes isn't like some kind of rational analysis of, of politics and, and our political predicaments. It's what kind of household you were born into. Democrats were generally born into democratic households. Republicans were generally born into Republican households. And that political orientation is usually solidified before children are could even tell you what a political party is. It's like 
the, the same as identifying with um, a, a sports team. And children develop that identification very early on, uh, and it predates a rational capacity to evaluate public policy. Once that is established, it, it colors your thinking from, from then on out. And what research shows is that people tend to um, support their party and their party's beliefs re regardless of um, the content of the policy itself. And it's not just Republicans who do that, it's Democrats too. So, so it's not whether or not you're a good person, it's not your character, it's your environment. What community did you grow up in? The second big mistake that people make is letting emotions get in the way. Obviously, we all have strong emotions about politics. If we didn't have strong emotions, we, we wouldn't be here tonight. All of us really care about changing the world, making uh, the getting progressive policies passed, making a difference. But when you get so upset that you can't be strategic in your conversations with people when you can't make uh, communicate your ideas effectively, then, then that's a problem. So learning how to manage your most emotions in uh, a conversation with someone you disagree with is extremely important. The third thing is that we often try to control what other people think. When we, when we go into a conversation, um, we, we think the other person has to listen to us and adopt our way of thinking or else. And people don't like to be controlled. It doesn't matter if we have a really good argument. It doesn't matter if, if our ideas are frankly, better than theirs, um, they naturally will push back if you are trying to control what they think. So it's important to step back a little bit and give people room to think for themselves. The fourth mistake people make is making others feel bad about themselves. And this comes up in things, terms of things like shaming and ostracizing and accusing people of, of being uh, unintelligent or selfish. Um, and all of those things we, we often do as a, as a way of ex exerting control, right? We're trying to force people to change their beliefs by doing this. But what the research shows is that it actually often drives people toward extremism. When people feel ostracized, when they feel shamed, um, they try to find people who make them feel good about themselves. And often that means turning toward people who are more extreme than them, who will tell them, you know what, forget about those other people who are making you feel bad about yourself. They're just bad. And we're the good guys. And you should listen to us. And finally, you're going to hate me for saying this, but um, arguing with reason and evidence. And this one is, is really hard to swallow. I know. But it, bear with me and, and listen. So here's the deal. In a courtroom, right, we all know that reason and evidence are, are used in, in order to make a case. So lawyers get up in front of a jury, they get up in front of a judge, and they present reason and evidence, and everybody listens and makes a rational choice, or at least they try to make a rational choice. But there's a big difference between a courtroom and a political conversation. In particular, a jury is chosen because it is unbiased. A judge makes a pledge to be unbiased. But when we come into a conversation with someone about politics, they make no such pledge. As a matter of fact, they are be they are beginning from a place of having a strong opinion and they're fighting back from that place. So when we bring our reason and evidence, they bring their reason and evidence and it turns into a, a stalemate. 
And if you were to take that example and put it into the courtroom, the, the analogy would be more like the prosecutor going to the defendant and trying to convince them that they should just give up because they actually are guilty of committing the crime, right? It's And the defendant isn't going to do that because they have their own reasons and evidence and biases for not agreeing. So you're going to have to set aside your reason and evidence if you want to have better conversations. So I'm going to stop here and just see if there are any questions or clarifications you need about this. And I see some. Uh, and someone asks, are you going to provide an alternative to the logic and reason approach? Yes, I am. So just bear with me. No questions. I try to get a feel about the other's thinking. Will I be covering this aspect? Absolutely. There's a lack of critical thinking often in the conversations I mentioned. Yes, there, there is. Okay, great. So, so next question, which of those five big mistakes do you tend to make most often? And just rank them from one to five so we can see where, where people are falling. Number four, that's my big. <laughs> Making others feel bad about themselves. How, how do you do that? Uh, it, it, it's not my intent, obviously. I, I don't think anyone, well, I mean, internet trolls do it, but that's what they live for. But <clears throat> that's not my, my intent. But it's tied to number five. Uh, reason and evidence or yeah reason and evidence and in the course of attempting to use reason and evidence a lot of people I end up having arguments with start feeling bad because the reason and evidence they they feel like they feel like it's a contest that they have to win and I I feel like if I lose it's actually a good opportunity to learn if I've lost the argument means well that means i have mm -hmm. to learn something. but they feel like oh i'm losing the argument this person's making me feel bad i mean there's a lot of emotional people in this you know world we live in and you know it's difficult to get them to dial back the emotions so when the reason and evidence is you know there's a preponderance of reason and evidence on the, your side of the argument then they start feeling bad because they're Oh, I'm losing the argument. This guy thinks I'm a POS, you know, piece yeah. of... And then they get angry and start arguing with feelings. And, of course, for a lot of these people, feelings are much more important than facts. That's well, why you, I'm speaking my truth. My <laughs> truth is, that, you know... Yeah, well, the, the thing that's really interesting from the, so the political science research is that that it's not really that different for Republicans versus liberals on this. Like um, our emotions are just as tied up with with our beliefs as they are for them. Um, and and we make remarkable factual errors in um, when it it helps our side of the argument just like they do. And uh, so, so I would urge you to, to think of this as a problem that we all face as human beings rather than kind of an, an us versus them thing. Um, the other thing that you bring up that's, that is really true is, is that an, uh, when we argue with reason and evidence, it really can feel like an attack on us personally when the other person tells us were wrong. And um, as a matter of fact, the, the, they've done brain imaging that shows that personal, the, the part of the brain associated with personal identity lights up when um, our beliefs are, are attacked, which, which means that we are, are identified so closely with our political beliefs. Um, that we we do become defensive when uh, our worldview is, is threatened. So very interesting. Um, okay, so it looks like arguing with reason and evidence is is the number one mistake out there. 
not surprised by that and letting emotions get in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very common. Um, and then the others are definitely there, but significantly less problematic. Okay. Well, if you so, with reason and evidence, or you find out that the reason and evidence is triggering these people, it kind of, I mean, you start with the best of intentions, but then you find you've triggered their emotions by presenting reason and evidence. Right. And it evolves. Right. Well, that's why we have a better way of doing 